Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Animus Corporation, providing insulin delivery products for people living with diabetes and part of the One Touch family. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hey, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. This week, best-selling author and radio host Kurt Anderson is out with his newest non-fiction book, Fantasyland. How America Went Haywire, a 500-year history. He argues that some of what makes America great is turning out to be not so good at all. And you may have seen him on the cover of The Atlantic Magazine and many others this month. You may not know he lives with type 1 diabetes. How all these various tendencies, many of which have done great things for America, but how all these various tendencies have always been part of the American character and how, in my view, um, in the last four or five decades, they, they've sort of uh, gone out of control. Uh, they're, they're, they're kind of like an autoimmune disease where, where these things that are good start destroying your own organs. And of course, what was I thinking of as I wrote that? But what happened to my pancreas 20, 30 years ago? We'll talk about Fantasyland, as well as other books that he's written, the fictional story, True Believers, where the main character has type 1. Plus, our new segment, Shop Talk, continues this week. Hear about a brand new product, In Pen, which aims to give people who use shots the same calculations and flexibility as people who use pumps. There's no visibility. There's no data. There's no reminders. There's no tracking insulin on board. There's nothing. So it's, it was either all or nothing. We now bridge that gap. Tony Galliani talks to us about what In Pen is and how it works and a giant community connection, the effort to help those hit by Hurricane Harvey. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to another week of the show. I'm so glad to have you along. If you're new to the program here at Diabetes Connections, we aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection about the celebrities and athletes in our community, as well as the healthcare companies and the tech folks working hard to make our lives easier. But you have a great story, even if you're not writing a bestseller or inventing a new high-tech diabetes product, and we are here to tell all of those stories. My son was diagnosed right before he turned two, ten and a half years ago. I do not have diabetes. I spent my entire professional career in local TV and radio news, and that's pretty much how you get the podcast, putting those things together. What I love about the podcast is that we get to spend an hour each week together as people who get it. So I'm excited you're here. A lot to talk about today. You know, I first heard Kurt Anderson speak a few years back. It was 2012, 2011. And he was speaking about having diabetes, about having type 1. He was talking about the latest book he had then, which was True Believers, a story about baby boomers um, with a big secret. I will not spoil anything here, but it's a great book. And the main character has type 1 diabetes. But it wasn't a case of a book being about diabetes. It was just a person who happened to have type 1 and was doing all of these other things. We talk about that more in the interview, and I'm really excited to have him on the show. His newest book is not fictional, although I think parts of it probably seem like it could be just to some. It is all about this, um, well, I'll read right from the description. It is about this strange post-truth fake news moment that we are all living through. And he talks about and demonstrates that this really isn't anything entirely new, but is, as it says here, rather the ultimate expression of our national character and path. America was founded by wishful dreamers, magical thinkers, and true believers, by impresarios and their audiences, by hucksters and their suckers. Believe whatever you want. Fantasy is deeply embedded in our DNA. It was fascinating to read this book and then to talk about Kurt Anderson about it, and I'm excited to bring you that interview coming up in just a little bit. And of course, we we talk about type 1 diabetes and how he was diagnosed as an adult and really what that has meant for him and what it's meant for his writing. 
Quick word from our sponsor from Animus. You know, I was excited to see that with the new insulin delivery system, Animus and OneTouch are coming together. I've been happy with Animus and its products for the more than 10 years. We've been using Animus pumps for my son, Benny. We also love the OneTouch products that help us make managing diabetes more simple. Putting these two brands together makes perfect sense to me. Now OneTouch has an even wider range of products available to help people confidently move forward in managing their diabetes. To find out more about Animus, part of the OneTouch family, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Animus, part of the OneTouch family logo. With the timing of this podcast, you know, it's very difficult to cover the very latest events. Uh, I used to do a, a morning radio news show. So every day, you know, you're catching up on the news cycle with a weekly podcast. It's a little bit more difficult. And I really want to talk about Hurricane Harvey and what is going on in Houston, in Texas. The timing here may be iffy, and I certainly hope at this point we are not still talking about people who need help. But if we are, please, please go to the show notes or really go to the Diabetes Connections Facebook feed because that will have the latest information I have about how to help those hit by Hurricane Harvey. This is our community connection this week. This is the biggest community connection I've featured so far. It has been amazing to see how people really all over the country have turned out to try to get supplies to those in need. Yes, there is a big coordinated effort, but it's the individuals in Texas collecting and getting supplies where needed. You know, we never know when we may be the ones who need help. So thank you for everything you're doing, all you amazing people there to keep the diabetes community safe in the path of Harvey and the flooding uh, that followed, really, that flooding, so much more of an issue than the initial weather. Man, it is the biggest fear. I've heard from so many of you that are so fearful about losing your diabetes supply, and I know many people stockpile, and to think about losing it in the flood that has happened in, in Houston is something that's very frightening to many. But to know that the community is there, um, I hope that adds a little bit of comfort to you. And again, we will get the information out best we can. Um, but I think that watching uh, Twitter, Facebook um, from reliable people is the best way to go about doing it. Quick word from Dexcom, from our other sponsor. And you know, I'm trying to raise my kids with independence and confidence and responsibility. And I was pleasantly surprised that using the share function of the Dexcom system helps with that. Using the separate Dexcom follow app, we can help Benny manage diabetes in real time at school, at a friend's, at a sleepover, overnight school field trip. And that gives us peace of mind and helps him feel like diabetes can't hold him back. With the Dexcom G5 mobile CGM system, dynamic glucose data can be accessed and shared safely and conveniently anywhere, anytime to your compatible smart device, as long as there is an internet connection. The Dexcom G5 mobile is the only CGM approved for adults and children ages two and older with diabetes. Do not make treatment decisions based upon share and follow readings. Always confirm with your compatible smart device or Dexcom receiver. For more information, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. My guest this week is the author of the new book, Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, A 500-Year History. It is the cover story of The Atlantic Magazine this month, and you're going to hear and see a lot of it. And I've wanted to speak with Kurt Anderson for a long time, and not just because he is also the host and co-creator of Studio 360, the cultural magazine show produced by PRI, Public Radio International. And Anderson is also the author of several bestsellers, The True Believers, really caught my eye a few years ago because the protagonist has type 1. And it is, it's not a contrived plot point. It's just part of her life. And Kurt Anderson knows about that because he has type 1 diabetes. Kurt, welcome to Diabetes Connections. I am thrilled to have you. Thanks for spending some time with us. I'm totally happy to be here. Well, let's start with diabetes. You know, when were you diagnosed? You were an adult, right? I, I was an adult. Uh, yes, I was not a juvenile. I was 30, 32 years old, almost 33. I hate to ask this question, but what was your reaction? I mean, anyone in your family have type 1? Did it come out of the blue? It came entirely out of the blue. And uh, my, my reaction was, well, like anyone's reaction, if they are, especially if they are uh, an adult, I suppose a, ch a child's reaction would be different, but was surprise, uh, shock, um, you know, uh, this, this, this important new fact suddenly being inserted into your, into your life important permanent new fact. So yeah, it was, it was, it was shocking, but on the other hand, you know, it, 
having been through a couple of weeks of symptoms, wondering what, why, what, huh? Uh, it was, it was. I mean, <laughs> the 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 upside was I suddenly knew what the problem was. Yeah, yeah. How sick were you? I mean, was it to the point where you had to be hospitalized? No, no, I wasn't. Okay. In fact, it was it it uh, I, I I I it became acute when I was uh, uh, I was in Disney World uh, reporting a story. Um, and uh, uh, on work, on you know, there for work. I was with my wife, and uh, it was, it was, no, it was nothing horrible, or uh, that I had to be hospitalized. I just simply, uh, you know, <laughs> bought a drink at every possible kiosk at Disney World that I could, and then spent the rest of the time in the bathroom. Wow, yeah, classic stuff. Yeah. Wow. This is, well, this is an obvious question to ask. Did your life change? Obviously, it did. But did it change in obvious ways that you told the people around you? Did you tell people at work, or did you kind of manage it and go from there? I mean, I didn't announce it to everybody I knew, uh, you know, uh, immediately. But I was not secretive about it either, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I certainly. I mean, my family, my closest friends, of course. I said this. This new. There's this. Uh, you know, fairly uh, significant, profound new fact in my life. Um, but here's the deal, and you know, it's yeah. it's it's it, it, it's not it's not horrible, but it is not as perhaps um, uh, oh, that's nothing as as it has been uh, it is as it is often portrayed as oh, it's a perfectly manageable thing. Yes, yeah. but. Um, so no, and, and then you know, I mean, I you know, in my in where I was working then, uh, um, I, I I put a little refrigerator in my in my office back when I was more scrupulous about refrigerating insulin than I am uh, as an old man. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, so no, I was I was I was open about it, but didn't didn't uh, you know uh, wear wear a T-shirt that said T1D or anything. Well, I'm, I'm nosy about it because, you know, when you have a child who's diagnosed, I mean, my, yeah. my son was so young, it's such a different perspective because you sure. feel like you do you, you do wear the T-shirt that says right. type one and you, you do feel like you're announcing it everywhere you go. So I'm always curious when I talk to adults how they, you know, go back to their, quote, regular lives. Right. Well, I mean, and, and uh, as with all things, I mean, as with having children, for mm -hmm. instance, I mean, uh, you know, having children, as you know. Uh, as as all as your listeners know who have children, uh, Im immediately and profoundly changes your life. However, I think with 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 managing type one diabetes is is uh, ha having had uh, children since it, they're, they're similar in the sense that it doesn't have to it doesn't you know it will ch it changes your life as much as it needs to. But don't get ahead of yourself and think, oh my God, I'm this. I'm a, I'm sick. I have this thing and I have to, I can't ever do this. I can't eat this. I can't go here. And, and I find that people do that sometimes with children and mm -hmm. too, when they have children is, well, yeah, you got to manage it and your life is different. Uh, but it's, but, but don't make it more different than it, than it needs to be, you know? I do. I have a friend who posted, she'll probably kill me for saying this. She posted recently, you know, my, my child went off to college and, and if I'm not, you know, Mary's mom, who am I? And I right. wanted to reach through the computer and be like, what do you mean? You're still, right. you. I, I totally understand that. That's funny. right. And one of the, and, and just linguistically, I mean, I have, I, I, I have always, um, uh, I've never called myself a diabetic. If somebody says, oh, you're a diabetic. I say, yeah, sure. I have type one diabetes. And it doesn't like, I'm not angry about it, you know? Right. Uh, uh, but, but to say I am a diabetic, it's like, it, it's, it's, well, I would say I have diabetes together with these other 10 salient things about me. Do you know? And, oh, yeah. and so, uh, yeah, that, 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 my own, that's, that's, that's the only like, uh, like, hmm, uh, uh, not identifying entirely this as my whole life. You oh, know? Yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do your kids know a lot about it? I mean, they they must know it just as part of dad's life. Well, they know it as part of dad's life, and it was dad uh, was was uh, you know I mean then they dealt with you know hypoglycemic episodes uh, that I were 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 more serious when they were young, and and I and I was new to diabetes uh, mm -hmm. than 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 has has been the case since, and so yeah, they had to deal with like why is dad acting weird? Why did dad just yell at me for no good reason? You know all all, all of the things that happens. During hypoglycemic uh, episodes. Yeah. 
All right, now I'm going to be even more nosy. Do you mind uh, sharing how you manage? Do you use an insulin pump? Do you? Do you oh, that's not it? so nosy. Nosy, <laughs> nosy. Um, I do not use an insulin pump. I, 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 uh, I take, I prick my finger and and uh, many many times a day because uh, I have had office jobs since I've had diabetes, but mostly I've been a writer, mostly working at home, which which among other things enables me to manage manage it in terms of, of, of taking my blood all the time without having to you know go in go in the in the bathroom down the hall of my corporate uh tower you know so uh no i i don't use a pump i i uh i take my blood many times a day and 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 titrate my insulin dosage many you know in in i don't know whatever half dozen times a day and uh what else do you want to know no cgm I, I, Lately, I mean, the last couple of years, I have used as well a, a, a continuous glucose monitor, which which is, is terrific, and I like very much. Uh, which one do you use? Uh, Dexcom. Excellent. Yes, my son has used that for about three and a half years. We we yeah. love it. They're great. Yeah, they're great. Uh, and again, I mean, I, I I my hat's off to you. I mean, I often I have often talked to my wife and often thought about like, God, uh, have I mean, what I have to do to manage it as an adult who can do complicated algorithmic well if i did this much exercise and ate this much and then it's been two hours and how many units uh i just the idea of of a child having to de- deal with this, uh it's remarkable to me so um yeah well it's funny I, I we we try to approach it from the science experiment perspective you know every time we try something new like right now he's at football practice yeah and i we've never done football so we'll figure it out and, right. you know, and we'll just go ahead. It's going to be crazy, but that's what happens. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, and it is. And 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 again, my my wife was perfectly good at arithmetic and math. She was a business person for many years. However, I, I do, I have a knack for just doing arithmetic in my head uh, uh, that, that allowed, that actually has been a big help. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it really has uh, in, 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 in managing it. Excellent. So um, you use the CGM, you use the Dexcom. Do you share? Do you use the remote share feature with your wife or with anybody no. else so that they can remotely see your numbers? No. She 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 said, why don't you? I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, the people around you, uh, or that is to say your wife or your husband or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your whomever, leaving parents out of this, because, of course, if I were you, I would, you know, be looking at my kids uh, numbers all day long, but no, I don't because you know there, there's you, you, you there's this 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 dance that takes place. And yes, they're totally aware of it, and yes, they're in, indispensable co-managers of the, of it and all that. But like, no, that would make me feel uh, that would make me feel a little too surveilled. Yeah, I can I can completely understand that. And that kind of brings us to true believers, because the character in this book that you wrote, which is this it's not a book about diabetes in any way, shape or form. It's about a protagonist who has diabetes. She has that kind of that same attitude. This is how I'm living. I have, you know, I have type one checks her blood sugar. People kind of ask her throughout the book once or twice, you know, are you moody because it's type one? Are you low? Right. It, it was. Did you write that? in part because you didn't find anybody else in fiction who showed type one is realistic because we complain about it all the time. It's yeah. always, you know, Oh my gosh, they left the insulin at all. You know, it's a crisis. Well, and it, yeah, yes, I, 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 all, all of what you just said is true. I, I mean, I, I, it, most of, I, I mean, characters in fiction, uh, in the several novels I've uh, written, they, they, they are bits and sometimes they're out of whole cloth or out of bits of, other fictional characters you've read about, and certainly oneself, people, one known, family members, friends, somebody you saw on the street for five minutes, they are Frankenstein creations of lots of things. This, the, her, my character uh, in that novel, my heroine protagonist character in that novel, Type 1 Diabetes, was the most I've ever gone to. This is, I'm going to completely insert my my experience in her because for one, one of the, two, several reasons. <laughs> It, including yes, as you say, I, I, I've never, I had never seen it done in a, in a way that I thought was both realistic and, as you said in the introduction, not central. It's not like, you know, part of the. It, it is an aspect of her life that she has dealt with, and and it's it's and, and there are 
and, and she recalls moments where it was slightly terrifying or, you know, not easy peasy all the time, but it's not the main thing. It's just, it's an aspect of this character's life. Um, it's also, uh, in this particular case where a character was, she was this big, important lawyer and the head of a law school and worked for the government and was talked about for, to be on the Supreme Court and she's a big, important person. Uh, I, I didn't do this completely for this reason, but once I had started thinking, oh, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna give her type 1 diabetes, uh, I, I thought, oh, this kind of, this is a this is this gives her a struggle. This is a little bit of struggle. This gives her this her life is not so great as it as it looks. And then of course when you read the novel you realize that she's been living with this set of secrets and lies all her life. So so it's even more than that. But 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 it also it was just a thing like oh uh, she 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 seems to have it all. Well here's here's a here's a thing she had to you know. Yeah. Uh, what didn't come so easily for her. But yeah, I, I, uh, I often do things, uh, in fiction, sometimes whole books where I think that, that hasn't been done. I haven't seen that. So let me see if I can do that. I can, I can, I, if it, I can, I can do this thing that I haven't seen much done, perhaps, uh, better than, better than it has been done before. Yeah. It's a great place to go. It's, it's one of the reasons, if I could be, if I could say it about myself, why I started the podcast, because mm -hmm. I, there are, there are lots of diabetes podcasts out there, type one, type two, others. Um, but I didn't find one that I felt had that news, uh, person interview that I was looking for <laughs> that I like to listen to. So right. I decided to do it. Now, in, in True Believers, there's, there are a few passages that I kind of smiled about that I think people who aren't familiar with type one might not feel the same way. That particularly a point where she talks about how people offer her sugar free food and she tries yeah. to be polite about it. I'm going to guess that that happens to you. How do you handle that? It has happened. Not that much. I mean, again, uh, a little bit. I mean, I, I, I basically try never to make a big deal out of yeah. it. Again, not that I'm secretive or anything. And in fact, at like, one of the things I definitely do that that character does is 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 inject insulin very publicly uh, in restaurants and things and on sidewalks in New York City, um, uh, which nobody ever seems to uh, notice, which tells you nobody's ever looking at you when you think right. they are. But but um, uh, I'm sorry. What was your question? <laughs> I forgot. It was just about uh, when people offer you sugar-free items. Well, that that hasn't happened too much. I mean, people people don't understand and don't know, but you know, they don't. All they they also don't know and don't understand lots of things. Sure. Uh, the difference between NPR and the rest of public radio, for instance, and that's a that's a that's a uh, a question I could end up answering every day for ten minutes if I chose to. But instead, it's just like, oh, no, 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 I, I'm I'm fine. You know, just I, I'm ta it's. I'm taking care of it. Sometimes I go further and say, no, you see, and give the whole explanation of, you see, I can plan if I eat a cookie now that I can take more insulin to cover it. And, but, but that's, I seldom do that. Um, I seldom do that. Let's talk about fantasy land. Um, this book seems like it is, it is just for the moment. But of course you started writing this a long time ago. How, yeah. did this, how did this get into your brain? I mean, was this always there? Can you can you explain a little bit about yeah. how it happened for you? Uh, I, I have been thinking. I mean, it, it really brought together a lot of different uh, strains of thought and worries I'd had and observations I'd made about American life. Uh, really, starting in the '90s, I would say 1990s, about how everything had become entertainment, including. Uh, presidential politics about how um, the 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 what my one of my great heroes is Daniel Patrick Moynihan, mm. the former UN ambassador and senator from New York, who 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 started saying because uh, a friend of, one of my best friends was working for him at the time in the 80s and 90s. Um, everybody everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but he's not entitled to his own facts. And I just I found that so uh, meaningful as in the 90s and the aughts and, ten, you know, people I found that just lots and lots of people were were refusing to believe, uh, you know, very, very provably proven true things that for whatever reasons were inconvenient uh, for them to believe or 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 uh, went against their 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 wishes or their beliefs or their opinions. And, and I found that strange. I've always found uh, uh, um, 
the, I, I have always been um, not a conspiracy, not much of a conspiracy theorist. I always thought, you know, yes, there are real conspiracies around, but 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 I I saw happening as as I lived in America in the 90s and the aughts that more and more people I knew and more and more people in general were were ascribing everything to some evil conspiracy that I just felt most of the time that that's that that's implausible. That's not true. And so a lot of thoughts I'd had about and about about um, kind of uh, very ex- ex- what I regard as extreme religious beliefs, su- re- religious, supernatural religious beliefs. Um, and and I and I've just been thinking about all this for a long time. And finally, um, a few years ago, I thought eh, one of these days after I after I finish this next novel that I had started in 2013, uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll turn to nonfiction and figure out if there's a book to write here. And I, I mentioned the sort of half baked idea to my my publisher, who, and she said this is in 2013, way before Donald Trump was uh, running for president or considered a serious uh, politician. She said, well, that sounds very timely. I, if you don't mind, I really I hope you can see your way clear to putting the, this current novel aside and and figuring out that book and writing it. And I said, okay, I'll try. Yeah. And 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 uh, she was, you know, I owe her a lot in terms of the timing, you know, that, that when I began this book, as you say, in 2000, I began writing in 2014, nobody was talking about alternative facts or the post-truth society or any of that stuff. And and now they are. <laughs> so I, I, sort of, I sort of wrote into it. And, and it is the, 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 the subtitle is a 500 year history. It really does go back to the beginning and, 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 and try to figure out how how all these various tendencies, many of which have done great things for America, but how all these various tendencies have always been part of the American character and how, in my view, um, in the last four or five decades, they, they've sort of, they've sort of, uh, gone out of control. Uh, in fact, I, 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 uh, make an analogy at one point in the book to, to, uh, they're, they're kind of like an autoimmune disease where, where these things that are good start destroying your own organs. And of course, what was I thinking of as I wrote that? But, but what happened to my pancreas, uh, 20, 30 years ago? Well, you know, and it's really interesting to bring diabetes into this just a little bit because the diabetes community isn't immune to this kind of thinking. Right. I mean, there are all sorts of and you're probably not in these Facebook groups or seeing these conversations. There are all sorts of fake cures and conspiracy theories about cures and, and questions about vaccines. Right. I mean, it's, it's part oh. of the same issue. No, I mean, it's, it's it, I mean, it's one thing when when the pseudoscience that people listen if people want to eat uh, gluten free uh, foods, even though they have don't have celiac. Fine. Whatever. That's not hurting me. It's not hurting you. It's not hurting them. But when 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 the pseudoscience when the pseudoscience creeps into people with serious illness like type one diabetes, it's really dangerous, yeah. and and it's happening more and more. And and again, it's 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 not the whole book, but it's it's a you know a, a thread of this book, a significant thread of this book about how again from the beginning from the 1800s, uh, you know Americans were were prone to believing in various kinds of elixirs and patent medicines and quack quackery of various kinds that at the beginning of the 20th century, everybody thought, oh, we've we've put that behind us. We now have you know, we now believe in science. We now have an FDA. We now. But uh, who knew that in, in the last few decades, all that whole realm of, of belief would would have a huge revival. And that's part of what I talk about. Yeah. Well, and I should let you know, too, that um, when you talk about the conspiracy theories and things and how it's ramped up so recently, you know, I worked at a news talk station doing the morning news show for more than a decade. And that's the show. Uh, it's the station where not only you get your news weather traffic, but we had Rush Limbaugh on in the middle of the day and conservative hosts right. most of the day. Every once in a while, they'd have a liberal who would probably last a year or two or whatever. And we did right. the news in the morning. So it was it was great for me because I got to talk to a lot of interesting people and didn't have to talk anything personal. But it, I met so many listeners and heard so many people who were convinced that what they knew was right or what they thought they knew was right when a fact could be pulled up. You know, here it is. Right. And no, 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 no. This other website says or this other person says. No, and exactly. It's so exactly. easy to come to believe that. Well, that, that's exactly that's, well, that's, so that's why is that. Why is that an American thing? Well, 
it's not obviously unique to America, but but it is because a certain here, here, let's talk about what what the the original defining American things were absolute individualism. And I can I can believe what I want and I'm going to I'm going to make my own way. Uh, uh, also a kind of a kind of skepticism, which is uh, I don't have to believe what my priest tells me or my boss tells me or my king tells me. Um, uh, a kind of also speci very specific to America, actually, a kind of anti elitism that often was was the the same as and overlap with anti-intellectualism. Um, so you, all those things are, are okay as, as part of the American character, as, as instincts, until they, they get out of control, until they overwhelm reason and, 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 and prudence and, 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 and critical thinking about who really probably knows the, the actual honest to God scientific truth about X, Y, or Z. And, and that's what happened. And, and, and so those were there as very American tendencies. And, and, and I think, and I argue that, uh, and it's a complicated argument, but that in the late 1960s, when suddenly everybody could believe whatever they wanted, because it was cool and your truth was your truth and my truth is my truth and whatever, man, uh, that kind of let that that get even more out of control and then once you had the internet hmm. we were we, we were uh the, the the this destination where yeah anybody can believe whatever they want if because it suits them uh that's where we are today and and uh, again it's not unique to america but it, but it, there there are very american uh characteristics that that given complete freedom to, to, to wildly grow without tending uh, and given the internet and, 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 uh, and lots of other factors that I talk about in the book, uh, we, we've gotten to the place we are. Again, we're not, we're not alone in this, sure. but we are, we are extreme in this. That's a really interesting way to put it. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me, and because I, when I saw the recent events in, um, in Charlottesville, Virginia, the first thing I thought of, which is just strange, I've been reading the book, was the was the cosplay part oh. of when right when you talk about and and if you read the book, he's not just slamming or, or you know this is not a criticism of but you know right wing or it's about how Americans or you know we get immersed in these these uh, fandoms and things that we want to be a part of, and the people out there the the you know uh, the the alt-right extremists were wearing like cosplay shields. They were dressing up almost. I, I, is that, was that your reaction? I couldn't believe what I was seeing. That's my reaction. And, and, and uh, no, it, it's, and, and again, as you know, I, I write a lot about how there are these benign, all these benign playing characters, it, LARPing, cosplay, pretending you're a hobbit, whatever. Go crazy, fine. But in some cases, as one more p way in which Americans... Uh, are really, really invest, especially Americans, not just Americans, but really invest in these fantasy worlds and this, uh, it, it can bleed over into life. I mean, again, n n the reason uh, I have my doubts about the Tea Partiers is not uh, entirely apart from their politics, but I found it really weird in 2009 and 2010 when they would show up at their events in uh, 1776 uh, uniforms. I mean, to me, that was a little cuckoo. Similarly, in, in this much, much more uh, this grotesque way in, in Charlottesville, as you say, wearing these, you know, it, it's like they're playing army and like these boys playing army and they have their own little uniforms with their own little insignias. And, and, and uh, it, it is, it, 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 no, it was a very, it was a very striking, <laughs> it was a very striking dem illustration uh, to me of, 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 Here's what I'm talking about. Yeah, it, it was know, wild. It's, it's uh, I mean, it, you know, and and uh, it doesn't it doesn't make it better or worse, but it's a fact of of how these 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 fantastical and grotesque and ugly beliefs, neo Nazism yeah. and 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 white supremacy and all the rest, c can be merged with this other kind of fantasy that by itself is not so horrible, but but when when it's cosplay plus uh, anti-Semitism, it gets pretty, pretty horrifying. Oh, yeah. It's, it's just so ugly. Um, I looked through your book, and I'm looking for the solution 
um, very upset. You don't really offer uh, uh -huh. the solution at the end of the book. Um, but what do you think can happen? I mean, the Internet is, is such a wonderful thing in so many ways. I mean, again, with diabetes as an example, I found support that I did not have in the first few years of my son's diagnosis. Um, but I also now I'm also finding a lot of people that want to sell me a bunch of garbage right. and spread theories that are harmful. You know, how do we find that balance? Is it even possible anymore? Well, it's I, I, I don't. You're right. I don't have my, you know, seven ways that we can all, <laughs> you know, uh, turn this back and get back to the way it used to be, um, because I don't think I think the genie, the Internet genie and other genies are out of the bottles. Um, but. It's still, it's still new. We we still, as a culture, as a people, are 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 still learning how to use this. So naturally, we're going to go overboard and be crazy and not. Un we don't understand the kind of rules of of information hygiene like we do with food. I mean, I, I say in the book that you you wouldn't take a half-eaten casserole from a stranger on the bus, would you? You wouldn't pick up a pill off the street and give it to your kid, would you? No, of course not. But that's the way we treat information. You know, I was like, oh, I, I read this on the Internet. I think that's the way lots of people do, including sometimes our president. And, and that's uh, so we're, we're, we, we still have some learning to do and some and some we need to impose norms and rules just in our daily life and, and how we train our children, uh, you know, and our grandchildren to 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 regard information. It's new. Now that's and so we can do our best and we must do our best, but um, the you know the the it's 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 uh, I I I would I'm lying to you if I if I said yeah. I, I think it'll all it'll all it'll all swing back to great moderation and 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 people who uh, believe nutty untrue things despite all evidence to the contrary will go away and. No, uh, we, 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 I think we're in a place where, really where we can make it not get too much worse and we can we can we can insist on on facts and and reality based uh, thinking in our own lives and our families lives and our, you know, uh, communities as much as we can. But but we, we're, we're in a new place and, and it's and it's unfortunately it's not going to go back, uh, I think, to the way it was when I was a little child. Well. And I'm curious, too, in politics, um, do we have any politicians like Daniel Patrick Moynihan? I'm from New York originally myself. Yeah, um, we do have some individuals. I mean, uh, the, the uh, you know, there are some people I some some I I, I just uh, because I happen to hear an hour long conversation uh, interview with him last night. I, I'm very impressed with a guy named a senator, a U.S. senator from Colorado named Michael Bennett, mm -hmm. for instance. And, and and we don't know. You know, he's only been in the Senate uh, six or seven years and people haven't heard of him. But uh, there are there are individuals. There are still some individuals. Um, uh, but as and as 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 nutty and dysfunctional as our Washington politics are right now, um, I, I think we we sh one can be made a little more hopeful by not looking so much at Washington, which is particularly dysfunctional, that, you know, there are states and cities and, and towns where Democrats and Republicans and people from the left and the right get along and it, it functions. So, uh, I, I, I mean, looking at Washington as the only place you, 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 you take a look at politics can can be very disheartening because it's really messed up. And, 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 and that could change. I, I feel like Actually, I feel like our politics could be fixed probably, I'm not saying it's easy, but more <laughs> easily than the underlying problems I'm talking about of, of, of people uh, believing that in make-believe. Yeah. I, I, I don't that, – that's, that's a problem. As for our politics, w which are connected to that, to, to this thing that I talk about in this book, um, it's, it's really bad right now, but, but maybe – uh, maybe this is, maybe we've hit bottom. Uh, maybe, maybe this is as bad as it gets. I'm, I'm curious, and I don't want to, um, I don't want to offend my baby boomer listeners. Um, and Kurt, are you, are you a baby boomer? Are you really? I am, I am officially a baby boomer. I, I tend to, I tend to have some, uh, uh I, I identify more a lot with, with, uh, Gen X, but, okay. but I am technically a baby boomer. Well, I'm asking because I'm, I'm Gen X. And of course, you know, I've spent my life being told I was in the shadow of the baby boomers and there yeah. weren't jobs and, you know, you couldn't advance. And I've experienced some of that. But are we going to, 
are, are, as you mentioned, you know, the 60s where it was like, oh, whatever you want, it's your own way of thinking, you know, you're, you don't have to listen to authorities. Are, are we going to get a little bit better at the politics of it as we get past the baby boomers, maybe? Or do you think Gen X and the millennials are even worse? Well, I don't think they're even worse. Uh, and uh, maybe that would be nice. I mean, I, I, if, if we did um, get past the button, uh, I, I, I think I do have I do have some hope about younger people and and millennials. But it, the hope only goes so far it, as I and I spent for this book lots and lots of time looking at literally hundreds of pieces of survey research about how these attitudes about conspiracy theorists, theories and various kinds of fantasies have, have changed over the years. And, and I think that, um, and, 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 and there is a, a, a part of millennials who are very encouraging about being, you know, reality based. And, 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 and I think that's great and hopeful, but I think what we're really doing is, is not so much that it will change. Uh, that what will change is I think we're actually, I, what I think I'm seeing is that we're becoming too, Two cultures, two countries in this in this different way that isn't isn't about economics, uh, isn't necessarily about race. Although I don't want to d- diminish the degree to which either of those are true, sure. but it's about what I'm talking about. I, I think I think I think you know, uh, for instance, uh, the, the belief in 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 scientific evolution versus belief in literal biblical creation. I'm sorry, and and there are many points of belief in between where, oh, uh, I believe in evolution, but I think God used biology and chemistry. Fine. If you believe that, that's great. But the the, the people who absolutely believe that humans have always been humans and they've only been around 6,000 years versus people who totally believe in the biological explanations. I think I think we are we are becoming more uh, bipolar, that, that we're becoming two bipolar halves of society, the 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 scientific reality people and the and the I want to believe whatever I want because I read it on the internet last night or I saw saw it on Oprah or my pastor or, tells right. me it's it feels true. it feels better to me to believe yeah that. and and I think that's so I, I just I, I worry that it's another way in addition to the political way that we are splitting into two maybe irreconcilable halves Before I let you go, I I just want to ask you a couple more questions about Type 1, if I could. You know, as a radio host yourself, and as you say, you work mostly from home as a writer, have you ever had a a low blood sugar um, on the air? That's a good question. No, I don't. Well, you know, 60? Sure, probably. Yeah. But but never, like, I don't know what to say next, and I don't know who this person is. No, no, never, never in a way that has been a disaster. Um, uh, I, I, the closest I ever came, um, and if this guy is listening now, I apologize. <laughs> um, I, I was being interviewed, not unlike I am now, by some radio guy somewhere, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago for, I guess, for a book I'd written probably. <laughs> and, I, and, and, I, and I got very low in the middle of it, and I just, like, I couldn't go on, and I just hung up <laughs> in the middle <laughs> <laughs> so that's as close as I come. That's the one instance. No, I, I have never. It has never. Uh, I, I, I blessedly uh, have, still have very good subjective awareness of when my blood sugar gets low and uh, and uh, and test and 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 now you know the CGM is even more helpful. So no, fortunately, I have not. I have not. Uh, been on the stage or been on the radio or been in any uh, of the many places that I uh, uh, have my public life and, and had uh, disastrous lows. Yeah. Uh, what's your go-to for lows? Are you like a glucose tab uh, guy? Or? I am a glucose tab guy. And again, I, 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 I'm back when I was diagnosed and it's now almost uh, exactly, in fact, it's exactly 30 years ago. Um, uh, my, my doctor did a very bad job about, uh, preparing me for, uh, low blood sugar and, and how to deal with that and, and what to expect and how to, it was it, it kind of almost malpractice in retrospect. Um, so, uh, and I, I didn't discover <laughs> glucose tablets until some years after I, I was diagnosed. So yes, I am entirely a glucose guy because I know exactly 
how much a glucose tablet raises my blood. It's, and it's, it's, it's great. And, and unlike before I knew about them and I would say, Oh, I'm low. I'm going to go downstairs and eat a pint of Hagen dazs Right. Um, um, which was, you know, uh, one way to deal with it and, and, and gain five pounds in a couple of years. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, no, that's how I deal with it. Yeah. I'm trying to get my now almost teenage son to also, you know, not empty the refrigerator when he's low and it's a little more difficult because <laughs> he wants to empty the refrigerator anyway. No, indeed. Yeah. And, oh. and, and we all have that 10 year old boy within us. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and that 10 year old boy within us actually gets more 10 year old boyish and, and, and kind of rapacious, uh, when, when, when he, or probably she is low. No you know? doubt. No doubt. Um, I ask most of my guests this question, and you know, oftentimes it's for children. But for you know, half of people diagnosed with type one are over the age of twenty. What is your advice for somebody who is newly diagnosed with type one, an adult who's working, independent? Um, well, all I know is all I can speak from is my experience, yeah. and I don't know if it's better than other people's, I, I, or, or luckier, or whatever. But um, it it has in no way. Uh, it has not damaged my life. It, it, it makes it, it's a thing that complicates my life, and and it's a thing. At least, I, I, and, and I'm not a I'm not a Pollyanna, and I'm not. Oh, here, look at the good side of everything. <laughs> However, in this case, it, I was 32 years old, and and I had you know never uh, I, uh, I I at that point no longer smoked cigarettes, but I I had been a smoker. I, 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 I didn't live very healthily in many ways. I, moreover, I just didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, I still, I was still young enough to think like, Hey, I'm going to live forever, basically, you know, at 32. And, uh, it really, by, by focusing me on, no, I have to be healthier. No, I have to like be conscious of my health and my subject, all of the stuff that type one requires every day, all the time. And not to get morbid, but it, it, made me think made me made me feel and see that like now this ends mm. this ends life and and in a way that that i think absent this disease i i wouldn't have gotten to for another decade or more or ever yeah. it, it was it, it it focuses the mind it focuses the mind to me about what's important and how to live life and that you're you're in charge of your life and and of being sicker or less sick or healthier or not and uh, so I, I actually, I, 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 I actually think, I, I wish I, I wish I didn't happen. I wish I had never been diagnosed with type one diabetes. But I think, given everything that it's been, uh, uh, there are many good things that have come out of it. You know, for me. That's great. Well, Kurt Anderson, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you spending all this time and sharing your story and your and your book with my listeners. My total pleasure. Great talking to you. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. If you'd like to learn more about Fantasyland or about Kurt or anything we talked about, just head on over to the show notes or our homepage, diabetes-connections.com. And the show notes should be very easily accessible wherever you are listening to the podcast, any podcast app, you just click on that. Sometimes you have to click listen more or find out more. Some of them are a little tricky that way. The best way to listen to the show in my humble opinion, and to get the complete show notes is to get the Diabetes Connections app. And you can get that app for Android or Apple wherever you get all of your apps. It will have all of the episodes. Uh, you can easily sort out the bonus episodes. You can text episodes to folks. You can email me directly from the app. You can even fall asleep to the show or wake up to the show if you prefer. There's this little cute alarm on it. I'm If anybody's using that, let me know but it's there if you want it. The app is really easy to get. And uh, and the only note I'll tell you is it's difficult to get the show notes on Facebook or Twitter if you're listening that way. There really is just no way to easily link the notes as I link the audio. So please, if you have questions, go right ahead and head to the homepage of diabetes-connections.com. So we started a new segment last week. It's called Shop Talk, and it's a chance for you to hear from people who exhibit at diabetes conferences. 
I did all of these interviews from the vendor floor at Children with Diabetes Friends for Life this summer, a really big family conference. So there's going to be a bit of background noise to all of these. But, but this is a chance to learn about the latest and the greatest out there. Some of the products exhibited go on to huge success. Some are never heard from again. I think this week's is going to be a real hit. It is called In Pen, I N. P-E-N, InPen, made by a new company, Companion Medical. InPen is a reusable insulin pen that talks with your smartphone to track insulin and give you all the calculations, much like a pump does. Here is their national sales director, Tony Galliani. Yeah, our founder has type 1, and he developed this. He was on a pen, and he was on a pump, and he thought, boy, it would be great if there was a pen out there that did what my pump does as far as just visibility to what you're doing and, and tracking the data. And, um, and the response has been, has been incredible. InPen is a Bluetooth connected smart pen. So it is a, a pen injector paired with an app on your phone. And basically what it's doing is it's tracking all of your bolus insulin doses. Every time you dose either Humalog or Novolog from your pen, it tracks that on your app. Pump therapy is, is seen as the standard of care for type 1. And with pump therapy, you get full visibility to everything you're doing. When you're dosing insulin, how much you're dosing, it's tracking your insulin on board, it's, it's complete visibility to everything that's going on. But for patients on multiple daily injections, there's no visibility. There's no data, there's no reminders, there's no tracking insulin on board, there's nothing. So it's, it was either all or nothing. We now bridge that gap. We now allow MDI users to have that data, to see when they're giving insulin, how much they've given. There's a history, it tracks their insulin on board. It's got a dose calculator that takes in their insulin to carb ratio, their insulin sensitivity factor, their blood sugar target, their insulin on board duration. It takes all that into consideration when um, recommending a bolus, or recommending a dose. Can you share a little bit about how it works? I, I lift off the cap, I turn the thing, I use it like a regular insulin pen, but it, it, it's smart, it tracks it. Exactly, use it just like a regular insulin pen. And there's no maintenance required. It comes with, there's a battery in it that's powering the Bluetooth that's connecting it to the uh, to the app on the phone, but you don't have to charge it. Uh, the pen comes with a one-year warranty, so you, it's it'll last at least a year, the battery will. And every time you dose insulin, whether your phone is on or, or asleep in your pocket or in your purse or your backpack, every time you dose insulin, the app captures that and tracks and records that dose automatically, whether you're using the dose calculator or not. So if you're using the dose calculator, it'll recommend a dose. It'll store that as a recommendation, but you actually have to then deliver that insulin for it to be recorded as a dose. And I overheard you saying you're FDA approved, but not yet out. Correct. Yeah, we are. We are FDA cleared now. We have not launched yet. We plan on launching uh, this year. And we will, uh, we'll be updating our website as we get closer to commercial launch and, and people can get information on that right from there. Of course, I will keep you posted on the progress of InPen and you can head over to their website. I've got it all linked up in the show notes. Uh, they do expect to be launching in the next couple of weeks by the end of 2017, which, oh my goodness, I can't believe we're heading there already. But uh, we'll keep you posted uh, because it is approved. But as he said, it is not yet released. And Tony mentioned that their CEO has type 1. That is Sean Saint, and this is pretty interesting pedigree here. Prior to starting Companion Medical, uh, Saint was the Director of Advanced Technology and a Mechanical Engineer at Tandem. He also worked at Dexcom, he worked at Medtronic, and he has 75 issued and pending patent applications. So I'm hoping when they launch, we'll get Mr. Saint on to talk about uh, what they're hoping to accomplish with InPen. All I know is we took a pump break year and a half ago, two years ago, and I think it would have lasted longer, except for the fact that we could not track anything. We stink. I, I think like most people after years and years at a pump, we stink at writing stuff down. You know, doing the math is, is easy if you remember what you're supposed to be doing, and then there was no way to track insulin on board. That was really the key. So I'm, I'm very interested in following this. I think it's going to help a lot of people. As always, please follow us on social media, Diabetes Connections on Facebook and Twitter, and Stacey Sims on both of those platforms and on Instagram as well. Drop me a line. Let me know what you think. Stacey at diabetes-connections.com, S-T-A-C-E-Y. And if you like the show, please spread the word. Tell somebody else who is touched by type 1. Word of mouth is really the best way to grow this show. And thank you so much. You have done an amazing job so far of spreading the word and telling other people about it. 
I, I just want to get these stories out to as many people as we possibly can. And if you know of a good story, please drop me a line, ping me on social media and let me know. Grandparents Day is coming up. It is September 10th this weekend. And next week, we're going to talk about grandparents. We're going to get advice for caregivers from the author of a new book all about that and from a grandma who has really good advice about how she sees her role in the family dynamics with type 1, you know, and some pitfalls and, and some other things that happen. There's a lot of fear out there from grandparents, and that should not keep you from being part of your grandkiddos life. So I'm excited to bring you that show. I've been working on that for a while, and that will be next week. Thank you so much for joining me. I know how busy everybody is. Your time is valuable, and it's so great to just spend an hour every week with people who get it. I really appreciate you being here. I'm Stacey Sims, and I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>